But John 11, 38 through verse 44, and the word of the Lord today reads in this fashion from the King James text. Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou wouldst thou shouldest see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Past tense. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him, and let him go. Hallelujah. You know what I know. Jesus had been beckoned to Lazarus sighed when Lazarus was yet sick. He received word that Lazarus was not doing well. And yet, the Lord was not in a hurry, Johnny, to get to Lazarus. Sometimes, Bill, we're going through things. <laughs> and we pray and we call out to God and we wonder, Lord, why aren't you in a hurry to get to me? Why aren't you? Why aren't you as panicked as I am? Why aren't you as fearful as I am? Why aren't you as concerned as I am? Well, it's because God knows He's God, even if we've forgotten. Amen. And He knows He'll be God when He gets there. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm gonna tell you, the biggest problem we as believers have is learning to rest in the Lord and just believe that God has everything under control. Boy, I mean to tell you, if there's anything I wrestle with, folks, that's it right there. I'm a worry wart by nature. Got news for you. My, my family on my mother's side especially, it, I come from a family of worry warts. My great-grandmother, bless her heart, she was a worry wart. My grandmother, she was a worry. She'd drive my grandfather crazy because she was a worry boy. My mother tends to be a bit on the worry inside. We all take, I'll panic and blow a gasket sometimes over situations that I'm in. And then the very next day, God comes through in miraculous fashion. And there I sit feeling like a fool. Because yep. if I had just held on one more day. If I had just stayed calm one more day, Bill, guess what? The answer was on the way. But oh no, I had to blow a fit. I had to lose my temper and get upset and yell and scream and holler because the situation was more than I could bear, I thought. And literally, folks, the very next day, I'm not kidding, if I had a nickel for every time in the last 25 years I've been in affirming ministry, I had a nickel for every time I thought we were going to have to shut down our work 
and closed down our ministry because we didn't have the money to pay for nothing and we were completely broke and trying to get support. I've told you a thousand times, trying to get support is about impossible. You can beg and plead. People don't care if you slice your wrists and bleed out in front of them. They're still not going to do nothing to help you. I've learned that. and it, I can't say I fully accepted it, but I've learned it. That's one thing I know. I'm talking today about, do you know what I know? Well, one thing I know is getting support in our communities about impossible. And I mean literally, I told Tommy, I said, I think we're going to have to give up our lease. I think we're going to have to give up our space. I don't think we're going to be able to continue the church. I don't know what we're going to do. And I would just have a fit, right, Booby? Yep. The very next day, the very next day, a check came in the mail for twelve hundred and something dollars. Listen to this now. From Norway. From an LGBT man by the name of Willie in Norway. See, and here I was having a fit. Because God wasn't in a hurry like I was in a hurry. He wasn't near as concerned about it as I was. Because uh, the Lord knew I had another day to go. I'd be all right for another day. I just didn't want to accept that fact. I'm going to tell you, Jesus wasn't in a hurry. By the time he decided that it was time to go and look out for Lazarus and look in on Lazarus, Word came to him, excuse me, he turned to his disciples and he said, By the way, guys, I want to let you know, Lazarus is dead. Well, Lord, why in the world would we even bother making the trip if he's already dead? See, I'm going to tell you a little secret today, and I hope this inspires your faith. I hope it encourages you. God don't need to get to your problem, listen to me now, to know what your problem is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord doesn't have to be on your doorstep to know what you're already going through. Yes. He knows what you're going through. He knows what's happening. He knows what's going on, even when he's still afar off. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. And I'm going to tell you something about God. God don't show up unless he's planning on acting up. Yes. Amen. He said, let's go. It's time to go. Lazarus is dead. Well, Lord, if he's dead. No, no. If I'm planning on going, you can bet I'm planning on doing something. There you go. Amen. Let's go. And off to Lazarus they go. The Word of God said when he arrived in that little town where Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, lived, they greeted him with all the faith that they could muster. Lord, if only you'd have been here sooner. <laughs> Isn't that the way we tend to think? Yep. Lord, it was within your capability as long as, mm -hmm. as long as the situation didn't get this bad. Lord, once the situation gets to this point, it's kind of beyond even your ability. Oh, God, help us to stop thinking that way. God, help us to quit putting God in a box. Am I telling the truth? Lord, help us to quit putting God in a place of conditions and believing that He's only able to do something to a point. I said, Lord, if you'd have been here sooner... Oh, I've got so much faith in me. I just know Lazarus would still be alive if you'd have got here sooner. And the Lord turned to them and said, Listen, let me tell you a little secret. If you can find the faith to believe a little bit further, if you can just find the faith to believe a little bit more, I promise you, you're going to see something you ain't never seen before. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you something, friend. When your problem gets so bad and so dark and so dead, that you think all hope is gone and it's even beyond God's ability to do something. That's a good time for God to show up. Hallelujah. Because I'm going to tell you, the Lord loves to show people that He can do what the Word of God says exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we might ask or think. God loves to show up and kind of blow our minds. 
When I was in the hospital in 2000, I, I was so sick for a year and a half, I thought for sure that the Lord had given me up for dead. I made up my mind. Oh, well, I told my mother. I said, Mother, I'm not going to see my 35th birthday. My mother said, oh, honey, don't say that. I said, I'm not kidding, Mom. I really, I, I was serious. I didn't think I, I didn't think I was going to see my 35th birthday. This was maybe in July or so of 2000. I wound up going into Yilma Haven Hospital in August, early August. And uh, I was so sick, you know, losing weight, couldn't digest food, nothing was going, had a parasite in my system, took three hospitalizations that summer to diagnose what the problem was before they could even treat it. Then when they finally start treating it, don't you know, I wound up with double pneumonia, both lungs. Go to the doctor, he tells me, I've got to admit you right away. He said, Charles, I've got to be honest with you. I do not know if we're going to be able to save you. You may die. That's what he literally said to me. You know, it's one thing, Bill, have a doctor look at you and say, you've got cancer. It's another thing for a doctor to look at you and say, you've got HIV. It's another thing for a doctor to look at you and say, you've got this or you've got that. But it's something entirely different when they look at you and say, I'm not certain that we have the ability to keep you breathing. They immediately put oxygen on me. He told me my lungs were so full. He said, I don't even know how you're talking to me right now. I said, your lungs are so full of fluid almost to the tippity top said you're you're in bad shape i was unconscious within a very short amount of time i i remember them rushing me across because my doctor was across the street from yale uh, hospital i remember them rushing me across the street to yale i remember ha having the oxygen under my nose and the the canister under the wheelchair and all that i remember them putting me in a bed and that's the last memory i have that's all it took and i was unconscious Next thing you know, I'm waking up and my mother's standing over me. Now, my mother was living in Texas. And she's standing over me and there I am in a bed. My hands are tethered to the side of the bed. I've got life support. I've got uh, intubation going down my throat. I can't talk. That machine is... If that thing stopped, I did too. I'll tell you, that's scary. Scary when you wake up and you realize that a machine is breathing for you because you're not in a position to breathe for yourself. My hands are tethered to the bed. They've got all kind of medication running through my veins. I was terrified out of my mind. One of the effects of the Ativan, at least, or something they had me on, it literally made me so paranoid I couldn't hardly stand it. It, it gave me an internal case of the shakes. and I mean, Johnny, I'd have jumped out of my skin at the drop of a hat. There was this paranoia, this horrible feeling of, oh, I, terror, absolute terror that was in me. And then my hands are tethered to the bed. And imagine how that added to the... And then I look up at the ceiling and the ceiling's on fire. Literally. And not just, you know, little cute flames shooting out here and there. No, no. I mean, just billowing flames. And smoke everywhere I see up on the ceiling. But I turn around I looked around and the nurses are walking around like they always do. The doctors walking around like they always do. And I literally, I don't know how I did this, but I had enough sense to know I was hallucinating. I had enough sense. I said, well, that can't be real because if that was real, they're not going to be walking around like they're walking around. <laughs> so I must be hallucinating. But I'm telling you, the things that went on, it was a horrific experience. I thought for sure Johnny, that my opportunity for a miracle had passed. I thought for sure I was dead and in the grave already. Not only dead and in the grave, but my God, dead and in the grave for four days. I got news for you. Within four days, decomposition has begun. Things have begun to break down. Oh, I mean, if a situation's going to be Man, it doesn't get much worse than this. Oh, Lord, if only you'd have showed up when he was dead an hour. 
If only you'd have showed up before he went into uh, uh, rigor mortis. If only you'd have showed up before he went stiff. You know, then maybe. But Lord, he's been dead four days. And Jesus said, take me. So y'all making me tired. Y'all, well, I'm going to tell you a little secret, folks. Lack of faith, the Word of God said it is impossible to please God without faith. Lack of faith does not impress God. Lack of faith does not please God. That's why we are called to believe God in every circumstance, in every situation. And we have to literally try sometimes to keep our faith encouraged and to keep our faith alive. Uh, I tell people who are sick in the hospital, if I go in to pray for them, I'll say, listen, go into the New Testament, read the, the, the Gospels, look at all the stories of Jesus healing people. Well, why would I do that? Because I'm going to tell you, you do that and your faith is going to be encouraged. You'll be surprised. Your faith grows as you feed it all these testimonies of God's miracle working power. It literally feeds and energizes and encourages your faith. That's why when I go into a hospital to anoint with oil and pray for somebody, I generally will begin, Johnny, by sharing with them how that in the Old Testament, God was a healer. Then I go into the promises of God in the Word of God. In the Old Testament, He said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. Hallelujah. The Word of God said, there is a balm in Gilead. And that balm is for the healing of the nations. The Word of God promises, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And by his stripes we are healed. Then I go into the New Testament. I say, now when God showed up in human form, he didn't quit healing. He kept on healing. And he healed and he healed. And then when God ascended from human form and once again assumed a spiritual form and returned to the church in the manifestation of what we call the Holy Ghost. Guess what he did? He continued to heal people through the power of the Holy Ghost. He told his disciples, go out and preach. He said, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead. Why would he tell his disciples to go do these things if the ability to do that wasn't going to be there? Word of God, I explained to them that the Word of God said in the book of Mark, These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They'll lay hands, excuse me, they'll uh, take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. They shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. And then I go into the New Testament promises. The word of God said, Is there any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of the church and let them lay hands on them, anointing with oil and praying in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. I said, I'm going to tell you, but when I go in to pray for somebody, I don't just walk in the door and start praying. Because no, the currency that is accepted in heaven is faith. you got to have faith. I know Michael, what's his name, sang that song a while back. Wasn't it Mike, somebody... But you got to have faith, folks. People wonder why. Well, I pray and I pray, but nothing happens. That's because you pray, but you haven't got faith. What are you praying based on? You're, you're praying in desperation. You're not praying in faith. Well, how do I pray in faith? To pray in faith, you got to get hold of the book, and you got to get hold of the promises, and you got to rush up to your Father in heaven with a promise in your hand. God, you said. You said by his stripes I'm healed. And you go to the Lord and you're like a child going to daddy. Saying, daddy, if you said it, you know I believe it. And God can't resist anybody who comes to him in faith. I'm going to tell you, I've seen God change his mind about some mighty powerful things in my day. I've seen people who were on death's door, including my own great-grandmother. We went before the Lord in prayer. 
We weren't just desperate, Tommy. We believed that God was able to raise her up, and He did. She should have died, but she didn't. God gave her a miracle. She went on for another year and a half, lived to be 89, almost 90 years old, missed 90 by just a couple of months. Took us that year and a half to let her go. It took us that year and a half for the Lord to convince us it was her time. Because I'm going to tell you, we loved great grandma, and if she'd have lived to have been a thousand, it wouldn't have been a day too long for us. But we went to God not out of desperation. We went to the Lord in faith. And I'm going to tell you, God said, okay, fine. You want her a while longer? I'll let you have her a while longer. God does change his mind, folks. Don't you think he does it? There are times when faith can move mountains and faith can change circumstances. But Jesus shows up at the tomb and I want to focus, if I can get myself focused, I want to focus on one particular phrase that he spoke at the tomb. The Word of God said, Then they took him, excuse me, they took him to the grave. It was a cave they there was a stone at the door of the cave. The Lord said, take away the stone. I'm going to tell you a little secret. Sometimes that miracle you need is going to take a little bit of work on your part. Mm. God ain't going to do everything for you. Amen. I've seen people in church. And now, you know, y'all people out there, you're not Christian. You're not a believer. You think this is a bunch of hooey. You think us Pentecostal people are a bunch of crazy nuts. Um, let me tell you a little secret. I've watched people stand up out of wheelchairs in a little local church, not in a Benny Hinn meeting where they make a dog and pony show out of it. In a local church with a bunch of Christian people who were sincere as a heart attack, got around that person and began to pray. And I've seen limbs that were so bent up with paralyzing arthritis that they, they were like pretzels. Their limbs were like pretzels. And Bill, I've watched those limbs literally straighten, watched them in front of my eyes. You can think what you want to think. Believe what you want to believe. Think God is a fiction if you want to believe God's a fiction. I've watched this with my own peepers. Then I've seen people stand up out of wheelchairs that doctors had said would never a day in their life ever be able to stand again. I've seen people who broke their necks in diving accidents and the doctor said they were paraplegic. They would never be able to move from here down. And that person, this one girl I know, literally said to that doctor, You don't know my God! He said, You'll never be able to move from here. You'll never be able to walk. She said, You don't know my God. Oh, yes, I will. And honey, I was in the church. I was sitting in the pew when she walked. In, walked in, walked in, walked in! Don't tell me God isn't real! Tell me that somehow or another she was just able to will herself into walking. Well, that's funny. Christopher Reeve would have loved to have willed himself into walking, but he never was quite able to do it, was he? But when your faith is in a living God, who's able to do things even when that old body been in the tomb for four days, even when it seems so beyond hope that it's hopeless beyond hopeless. I'm going to tell you something. Things can happen. Standing at the grave, the Word of God declares, the Lord lifted up His eyes and He began to pray. Now I'm going to tell you a little secret. All the miracles that Jesus ever performed... You never saw him pray for the person. Think about it. When you read the Gospels, where do you see Jesus ever praying for a person who was sick? Oh, he spoke to the dead child, the, the son of that woman, that widow woman, and he told that child to come back into his body and to come back to life, and that child came back to life. The Lord didn't pray for the kid. When he laid hands upon the blind, he didn't pray for them. 
when he laid hands upon those who were broken and those who were paralyzed, he didn't pray for them. Never do you see Jesus praying for anybody. But listen carefully why Jesus was praying at the tomb and what he was praying about. He didn't pray one word for Lazarus. Listen. He said, Father, I thank Thee, listen, that Thou hast heard me. Well, what do you mean, Lord? You haven't said anything till now. <laughs> You're just starting to talk now. Why are you talking in the past tense? I thank You that You've heard me. Well, because the Lord lived a lifestyle of prayer. I'm going to tell you a little secret. When you live a lifestyle of prayer, when you talk to God more than when you need God, hello now, when you talk to the Lord and you commune with the Lord and you fellowship with the Lord on a regular basis, then you can know, what do I, do you know what I know? You can know that when you're really needing Him, He's listening. Why? Well, because when I wasn't really mean you, I know you were listening then to it. Hallelujah. Whoa, this is good preaching today. See, y'all getting a little bit happy in your spirit, aren't you? Aren't you getting a little encouraged? Uh, yeah. Yeah. He said, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, past tense, and I know that thou hearest me always. Ooh. And I know. Do you know what I know? And I know that thou hearest me only. Oh, thank God he didn't say, I believe. I trust that you hear me always. I believe. I'm trying to believe, Lord, that you always hear me. How many of us, when we go to God in prayer, that's the attitude we go with. Lord, I'm just trusting you're hearing me. Oh, God, I'm just believing the Word of God says you're listening, Lord, so I'm just believing you're listening. Jesus said, I know that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it. He wasn't praying for Lazarus. He was praying for a very specific purpose. Because all this unbelief and all this lack of faith around him, he wanted to make a point to these people. You see, while y'all sitting here wondering why in the world I'd be crazy enough to move a stone away, why I'd be crazy enough to tell them to take a stone away from the tomb of Lazarus, while y'all are sitting here wallowing in your unbelief and grieving and mourning, I want you to understand my attitude. Lord, Father, you always hear me. I know you always hear me. I know you always hear me. I know you always hear me. Boy, that guy, when he talks to God, he talks like God is constantly there on the ready listening. How many of us, when we talk to the Lord, we have come to the place in our walk with God that we believe that we know, not just believe, but we know He's listening. Well, I'm going to tell you today, I don't know about other people, but that's my experience. I've been in this thing so long, Johnny, that when I talk to God, I'm not sitting there wondering whether or not He's hearing me. I know He's hearing me. I know He's hearing me. I know He's hearing me. It doesn't matter whether my situation is good or bad. It doesn't matter if it's a dark day or a, a dark, uh, excuse me, a bright day or a dark night. It doesn't matter if it's cold or warm. Whatever my circumstance, whatever my situation, I know that God is listening. Yes. I know it! Yes. That doesn't mean He always leaps to my aid. That doesn't mean He always jumps to my every word and acts immediately in response to everything I ask Him. No, there are times that 
He'll wait it out. I lay in that hospital for a month on life support, a month, a month on intubation. I was sure as shooting that I was headed for heaven. I was sure as shooting that God had given up on me. That it was His desire and His will to take me home and there wasn't nothing nobody was going to say to change that. Then all of a sudden, Brother Ronnie over there in Arizona, he and his church got around a prayer cloth and they anointed a prayer cloth and they sent it to me, Federal Express. And my mother brought it into the hospital for me, and she had to open the Federal Express envelope. They finally had untethered my hands and given me a crayon and some paper so I could scrawl out messages to my mother. Mom says she has the, the pad of paper somewhere with my messages scrawled out on it. One day I'll have to see that. She said it took some, you know, trying to understand hieroglyphics to understand what I was writing because I was high as a kite, you know. I took the envelope. I couldn't even open the Federal Express envelope. Literally, people, I'm not joking. I literally could not. I was down to 135 pounds. Half my body weight almost. From 260 to 135. There was a gap between my legs. I, it, I, then I couldn't stand, but later when I got out of the hospital, I could literally stand with my ankles together and there was a gap between my legs. That's how much weight I lost. It was pretty dark. Doctors told my family for that entire month that I would be dead within 24 hours. Can you imagine? For a month, they're telling you over and over and over and over again, he'll be dead for the days out. He'll be dead for the days out. He'll be dead for the days out. My mother said every time they left the hospital and went home, Every time the phone rang, she just knew it was them calling to say I'd finally expired. But no, hadn't expired. I was hanging in there. Brother Ronnie sent this prayer cloth. Mom opened the envelope for me. I reached in and I touched, and I knew the minute I touched that handkerchief that they had anointed with oil, I knew exactly what it was. I knew it was the prayer cloth. I'm going to tell you a little secret. The Word of God said special miracles were wrought at the hands of Paul so that they would take handkerchiefs and they would take uh, articles of clothing to him. And he would uh, pray over that article of clothing or that uh, handkerchief. And then the person would bring it back to the person who was sick or who was demon-possessed and they would be delivered of their demon or they'd be healed of their sickness. That's why we do that. It's not black magic, not white magic, not Christian magic. It's based upon the Word of God. Jesus said, greater works than these shall they do which come after me. He said, people that are coming after me, my believers are going to do bigger things than I've done. Nowhere in the Word of God does it tell us they brought clothes to Jesus and then carried those cloths or those clothes to other people. But in that's what God did through Paul. Do you follow what I'm trying to tell you? And therefore, we believe, hey, if God did it through Paul, God can do it again. And that's why we send out prayer cloths when somebody really needs a way to kind of connect their faith to their circumstance. And that's our way of saying here, this cloth represents our faith on your behalf. We've prayed over this. Now you just let your faith combine with our faith and God's going to do it. And when I felt that prayer cloth, I said right then and there, I said, okay, Lord, let's get it done. Because Johnny, I knew. Listen to me. I didn't believe. I knew. According to the Word of God, I was going to get a healing. If I believed it, I'd get a heal. And I said, Lord, I'm not going to make you look like a liar. I'm not going to turn around and die and make you look like a liar. There's no way in the world. At this point, if they send a prayer cloth, that's a signal to me that you want me to live. And I said, all right, Lord, let's get it done. Not with my mouth, because I was intubated through the throat. But in my mind, I said, Lord, let's get it done. Folks, I kid you not, the next day they took me off life support and I immediately began to mend literally the next day 
They had tried to take me off the life support about two weeks earlier. After I had been on for two weeks, they took the intubation out and I was drowning in my own lungs. I was literally drowning. It was the most terrifying experience. I will never forget it as long as I live. Scared the life out of me because the doctors and nurses kept saying, breathe, 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 trying to breathe, trying to And I was trying. And I literally could not get that much oxygen in my lungs. And then finally they had to re-intubate me. And they told me later, they said, re-intubation is one of the worst possible things that can happen to a human being. Said, we try never, never to have to re-intubate when we're, when we're trying to take you off the intubation. You know, we try desperately to make sure we don't have to put you immediately back on because it can do a lot of damage to your vocal cords. They told me when I left the hospital, I may never talk right. I may never be able to sing. I may never be able to walk because my legs had atrophied so bad. But God gave me a miracle. That was 19 years ago, October, that I came out of that Yale New Haven hospital, that I come out of the hospital, having received a miracle from God, my own doctor told me, he said, Charles, I cannot, literally cannot, even begin to tell you what you might experience from this day forward because I have never, in all my medical practice, I have never seen anyone survive what you just came out of. He credited it to me having a powerful will to live. I said, no, it's not a powerful will to live. It's a powerful Jesus. Amen. 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 It's a powerful God. It's a powerful faith. It's the power of prayer. Amen. I said, no, it's not my will to live. I said, Cause let me tell you a little secret. I lay on that bed for weeks ready to go home. My will to live had faded out. Let me tell you, I was ready to just go. Sometimes things get so black. Seems like it's even beyond God's control. You may be going through something right now and things are just getting darker and darker. And about the time you think it's gotten so dark it can't get any darker, guess what happens? It gets darker. I've told you, when we go out to Oklahoma to the mountains there where we have some property, man, I mean to tell you, when it gets dark, <laughs> it gets dark. There are no street lights out there, folks. Driving back to Dallas, we go for at least, oh, probably close to 60 miles anyway, and there ain't a street light in the universe to be found. And I mean, if you don't have the moon, if you don't have stars, you're pot out of luck because the only thing you're going to see is whatever is in the direct beam of your headlight. That's all you're going to see. Right. Tommy and I drove that road a few months ago. I preached about it a while back. We drove that road. Now, I've driven that road dozens of times. I know what's lying on one side and on the other. I know exactly what's beside me, Bill. I know there's meadows and fields and cows and trees and forests and mountains. But all of a sudden, it was so dark, I couldn't see none of those things. And all of a sudden, that road I've traveled a thousand times seemed like, it was like I never drove it a day in my life. That road was brand new to me because it was so pitch black, I could only see what my headlights hit. I mean, a dog come out, nearly run out in front of the truck, scared the life out of me. I almost hit him. Thank God I missed him because I'm not interested in killing any animals. But I mean, I didn't see that thing, Bill, till he was right up in front of the truck because the headlights is the only light I had. There are times in this life we are going through experiences and it feels that dark. Yes. There are times in this life we are going through circumstances and we may be going down a familiar road but all of a sudden it's not familiar to us at all. 
all of a sudden we don't know where we are. <laughs> Lord, I don't. I, 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 all I can see is barely what's in front of me. That's all I can see. Because right now, my circumstance, my situation, my illness, my sickness, it's got me seeing tunnel vision. All I can see is what's directly ahead of me. And I'm scared to death what's going to jump out. Am I telling the truth? Uh -huh. Am I going to wind up in a wheelchair? Am I going to wind up paralyzed? Am I going to wind up sick the rest of my life? Am I going to wind up this way? Am I, am I going to wind up dead? Because our headlights is all the light we got, and we don't know what's going to pop into those headlights at any minute. We become so tunnel vision, that's all we can see. But Jesus said, for the benefit of those, let me tell you a little secret. People ask me, well, you're a one God, Jesus name, apostolic preacher. You believe in the oneness of God. You believe Jesus is the physical manifestation of the Father. Yes, I do, because the Word of God said in Isaiah 9 and 6, His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. There's only one. The Everlasting Father. There's only one. That's what the means. The Prince of Peace. I believe He's the Almighty God. I believe He is the Father in human form. We call Him the Son because He is in human form. Because He was born of the Spirit of God in a human form. So in that form, we call Him the Son. Yeah, I'm a one God preacher. People say, well then, who was Jesus praying to if He's the Father? Oh, they got me back to into a corner. They must be right. Theologically, they must be right. Because after all, Jesus was praying to somebody. Um, yeah. First of all, God is the Spirit. And just because Jesus was the embodiment of the Spirit of God doesn't mean all the Spirit was in Jesus. God's bigger than the man Jesus. Am I telling the truth? Yes. Right. Secondly, Everything that Jesus did and said in his life and ministry was for the benefit of the observer. And that today is you and I. Amen. Yes. When he prayed at Lazarus' tomb, he made this point abundantly clear. He said, the only reason I'm even vocalizing right now, <laughs> the only reason I'm even voicing this right now, is for the sake of those that are standing near me. Do you hear what I'm telling you? He made it abundantly clear why he was speaking. What was he speaking? He said, and I know that thou hearest me always. Yes. I'm going to tell you, children, you can know today that God hears you. He doesn't hear you sometimes. He doesn't hear you part-time. He hears you always. But the Word of God tells us today in 1 John 5, 14 and 15, And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that, listen, if we ask anything according to His will, he heareth us. See, the biggest problem a lot of Christians have is they're praying a bunch of crap that they don't need to be praying. The Word of God says, you have not because you ask not. Said the only reason you don't have is because you're not asking. If you, see, if you haven't got faith to believe God's listening, then you're not going to bother asking said, but you have not because you ask not. But then he goes on to say, and you ask, but you ask amiss. You ask for things you shouldn't be asking for. Praying for that house, praying for that car, praying for that dress, praying for that wedding ring, praying for that husband, praying for that wife, praying for that pretty person across the bar that you think is so sexy and so hot and they probably the worst thing you ever could have in your life. Sure. Christianity is not witchcraft. 
Witchcraft tries to bend the elements to our will. That's what the occult is all about. It's trying to control through spiritual influences, trying to control circumstances around us and make things happen according to our will. But Christianity, that's not how Christianity works. Christianity yields, Christians yield to the will of God. The biggest problem we got is we don't start our prayer by saying, Lord, show me your will. Help me to understand your will. I've gone into hospital rooms to visit people and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and told me it was their time to go. So I knew. You follow what I'm telling you? I knew. God spoke to me before I, before I ever met Him. The Lord spoke to me and said, Listen, it's their time. I'm not going to ask God to keep them here when He's done told me that His will is to let them go. Do you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You see, when you allow the Spirit of God to communicate His will to you, then it becomes so much easier to turn the matter over and let God do what God's doing. Because, honey, i got news for you. You might think you know everything about this situation there is to know. You might think you have all the answers. You might think you have all the information. I hate to admit this, oh God, I hate to confess this, but if I had a nickel for every time I thought I knew everything there was to know about a situation, hello now. Only to find out God knew way more than I knew. I knew a preacher years ago. I'm trying to hurry up. I knew a preacher years ago whose son passed away. He was a young man. And this preacher was very upset, or at least he acted very upset. When he preached, he would talk about how, in effect, he would talk about how God didn't allow his son to live even though he wanted his son to live. And the Spirit, I told you, God called me to prophetic ministry. People don't know what prophetic ministry is. I'm telling you, it drives me up the wall. Prophetic ministry is speaking, thus saith the Lord. There are times that God will speak through somebody prophetically, one-on-one -on -one or to a crowd, whatever. And boy, I mean to tell you, He'll set you straight in a flat hurry. Well, the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, I want to talk to you because I want you to write a letter to Brother Davis. And I sat down and the Spirit of the Lord began to speak to me about the situation. And the Lord said to me, He said, I told him that I was wanting to take his son home. I told him why I wanted to take his son home. Because his son was in a horrible marital situation, a terrible situation, and he was very disgruntled and very upset and very discouraged and very uh, despondent and, and, uh, and discouraged. And the Lord said, and if I had allowed him to live, he would have wound up in a very bad place. But see, before he forfeited his salvation, I was able to bring him home. Before he would have lost out with me because he'd have gone completely in the opposite direction, I talked to that preacher and I asked him, I said, listen, are you okay with this? Because this is what I need to do. If you want your son to make heaven, I need to take him home right now. That's pretty rough, isn't it? I wrote this letter and I mean, it was a pretty long letter. I mean, God spoke things through me. I never met his son, never laid eyes on him, never met him a day in my life. I had no idea if he was single or married, knew nothing about him. When I started going to this church, nobody talked about his son, nobody. It was almost like there was a taboo, you just didn't talk about him. I went to two people, another minister in the same denomination that this man belonged to that I was a part of, who was a friend of mine and a friend of his, and I said to this minister, I said, I'm going to give you a copy of this letter 
Because the Bible said, do not bring an accusation against an elder except in the presence of two or three witnesses. That does not mean that two or three people have to have seen the offense. It means if you are going to go and accuse an elder of something, you need to have two or three witnesses present so that that accusation is not then later misrepresented. So in an effort to make sure that this preacher didn't come back and say, well, he wrote me this nasty letter and he said this and he said that. Do you follow what I'm saying? I went to this other pastor and I gave him a copy of the letter. I said, I want you to read it. I want you to bear witness to what I said because I don't want any false accusations coming back at me about what I wrote. Then I went to a friend of mine who had also been in that same church with that same pastor. She'd been in that church for 25 years. Never talked to me about this preacher's son. Never. Nobody in that church talked about this kid. All I knew is that he had died. I didn't even know how he died. But guess what? The Lord told me. And I put it in the letter. See, God was trying to show this preacher, this is God talking. This ain't Charles. This is God. Because the stuff in that letter I spelled out to him was stuff I couldn't know in a million years and when Sister Johnson read that letter, she looked at me, her, she was white as a sheet. I'm not kidding. She said, my God, there is no way in the world you could know everything you wrote in this letter except for God. There is no way in the world. She said, my God said, I can't believe, I can't believe what you said. She said, everything you said is true. Every single word you said is a fact. Now, she didn't know, obviously, about what the Lord had spoken to the pastor about, you know. But as far as all the description I gave, the Lord told me all about this kid, about the marriage he was in, about the girl he was married to. I mean, details, folks, like they had a kid together that was not really his, but she tagged it on him to try to rope him into marriage. Yeah, I got news for you, folks. It still happens in the modern world. All of this, Tommy, I put in this letter. The pastor that I shared the letter with, he came back to me and he said, Dear Jesus, brother. He said, Do you know how many people on this planet know all the details of what you put in this letter? He said, There's probably about four of us. He said, I... I'm, I'm just blown away. He said, this is a word from the Lord for this pastor. I gave that pastor the letter. Because God doesn't take kindly to be an accused falsely. God doesn't take the word of God said through everything that Job went through. Job never brought accusation against the Lord. Isn't that what he said? And yet this pastor was literally preaching from the pulpit that God took my son even though I didn't want him to. And that was not true. God had discussed it with him. He had gotten approval from the father, the, the literal father, the, you know, the child's father. And, and this pastor had agreed that, okay, Lord, if this is what you must do, then so be it. And then this man had the audacity to get up and preach. Listen, this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. Now there are times when God will communicate His will to you before you ever pray about a situation. For instance, my aunt years ago had discovered she was carrying a baby and they had done some prenatal testing and they found that baby to have a hole in her heart and they found that she was to be Down syndrome. My aunt didn't believe in abortion, you know, obviously as a fundamentalist Christian. She wasn't about to have an abortion. The spirit, I was living in Texas. She's up in Connecticut. Johnny, the Spirit of the Lord come over me, gave me a burden for my aunt and for that baby. And I prayed and I fasted. And God laid on my heart, I want to heal that baby. Do you follow what I'm saying? So I prayed and I fasted so that when I went to Connecticut, I could pray for her. 
and God was going to heal her. And I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt. Any time God has ever given me, this is the term we use in a situation like this is a burden. God gives a burden to you for this person. When God speaks to you and says, I want to do this for this person. Do you follow what I'm saying? He's anointing you for that because it's His will to do that. Well, then when you pray, you obviously are praying according to the will of God. Why? Because God has revealed to you His will in this matter. You follow what I'm saying? If we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know, hallelujah, not if we believe, not if we think, not if we hope, but if we know that He hears us. Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desired of Him. Hallelujah. Do you know what I know? I know He always hears me, like Jesus said. I know that if I pray according to the will of God, God's going to answer well, what does that tell you? That tells you the first thing you need to know about then is the will of God. That's right. Romans 8, 26 and 20, through 28, trying to finish. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. What is that saying? I'll tell you what it's saying. It's saying when a Holy Ghost filled believer prays in the Spirit, when the Holy Ghost is, when you hear somebody praying in, the, in tongues, praying in the Holy Ghost, they are praying according to the will of God. They don't know it, but they are. The Spirit is helping you to pray, and the Spirit never helps you to pray contrary to the will of God. Do you follow what I'm saying? So when the Holy Ghost is helping you to pray, He's always helping you to pray according to the will of God. So this is why a Holy Ghost filled person prays in the Spirit. This is why part of what happens in our prayer life is we, we learn to yield to the Spirit of God and we allow our spirit to pray with the help of the Holy Ghost because by doing that we know that we are praying in the Spirit. We are praying according to the will of God. Of God. Do you follow what I'm telling you? That is one of the premier benefits of the Holy Ghost baptism. A lot of people think, ah, I don't need the Holy Ghost baptism. I'm going to tell you something. If you want to get your prayer life in line with the will of God, you better believe you need it. And Paul goes on to say in Romans 8, 28, And we know, no, not believe, not think, not hope, that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Bill, what we're going through right now, and I say we because both of us are going through some valleys. We know, hallelujah, we know that all things work together for good. Hallelujah. We don't believe it. We don't think it. We know it. The Word of God declares it so, and my confidence is in the Word of God. Amen. Lastly, today in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I have five minutes to keep it under my time limit. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that, you pre that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So Paul said, don't look like the world, don't think like the world, don't act like the world, but be renewed 
By the renewing of your mind, let God do a work over on your mind so you think differently than the world thinks. He said that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, I know that what God's called me to do is above and beyond everything else to seek His will, number one. I'm supposed to demonstrate to the world what it's like to pursue in my life not fleshly desires for wealth and fame and jewels and houses and land and, and property and cars and all this foolishness, but I'm supposed to demonstrate to a lost world what it looks like when somebody puts God first. And when the will of God is the first thing that I think of in the morning and the last thing I think of when I go to bed at night, and whatever I'm going through in my body, he said, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Whatever I'm going through in my body, I know that God wants me to show the world, show unbelievers, show the sinner, if, as it were, show them what it's like when somebody trusts God and has a goal and a desire to walk in His perfect will, not just His permissive will. I, I hate that term because it's not scriptural. God's people are not called to walk in God's quote-unquote permissive will. There is no such thing as a permissive will. If you're living this thing right, then you ought to be walking in God's perfect will will. Anytime you're not walking in God's perfect will, you are walking outside of God's perfect will. That's all there is to it. you got two choices. You can either follow the leading of the Lord or you cannot follow the leading of the Lord. No such thing as I'm going to go my own way and God's okay with it. It don't work that way. We are called to walk in the perfect will of God and we know. Do you know what I know? I know that God hears me every time I pray. I know that anything I ask Him that's within His will, He's going to give me. I'm not, I don't even have a question mark in my mind. When God speaks to me and says, I want to heal this person, I want to tell... This is why, i got, I got to tell you this real quick. This is why in Pentecostal church services, there are times when the Spirit of the Lord will talk to the preacher. Y'all had not seen this yet, because our little tiny church, we just had not seen it. But there are times I've been preaching in large churches. I mean, hundreds of people, including churches I've pastored over the years. And the Spirit of the Lord I speak to me and say, go lay hands on that person right over there. Now, God's not going to tell me, Bill, to go lay hands on somebody if, if He just wants me to tickle their forehead. No, it don't work that way. When God tells you to do something, it means He's wanting to do something. There was a time I was sitting in the church and Sister Barbara at the Riverside Church of God was up singing. And I love Sister Barbara. She was a wonderful, marvelous lady. I loved her to death. She was, I just loved her. There was something about her that I identified with. And the Spirit of the Lord said, go up and lay hands on her. I said, Lord, she's singing a special. Can you see somebody up in front of the church singing a special? And the, somebody in the congregation just stands up, walks up and lay hands on them? I said, oh, I'm going to look like a fool. I'm going to look stupid. I said, Lord, I can't do that. Finally, I said, Lord, please tell somebody else to do it. As soon as I said, I kid you not. That's why I said, people want to tell me God ain't real. Oh, honey, you're barking up the wrong tree. You, you haven't seen the stuff I've seen. I said, Lord, please tell somebody else to do it because I can't. The minute I said that, I kid you not. Those words no sooner come off my lips. Brother Gillum stood up. Walked up to her while she was singing. She's got the microphone singing. Laid his hands on her and she fell straight down to the ground like a ton of bricks. This ain't Benny Hinn crapola, folks. This is seriously, this is just a little local church with a couple hundred members, okay? This ain't Benny Hinn. This is how God really works in a church that's walking in the power of God. Later we found out, she testified... 
She had been diagnosed with breast cancer. Sister Gillum had been diagnosed with breast cancer like 30, 40 years before. When breast cancer, when if you had breast cancer, you died. And God healed Sister Gillum. Well, this was her daughter. She said they wanted to perform radical mastectomy. She said, I didn't want to tell my mother. I didn't want to worry her because she had gone through breast cancer years before. You know, she said... But dad came up and laid hands on me a few Sundays ago. She said, guess what? I went back to the doctor. The breast cancer is gone. They can't find it. There is no evidence at all that it was ever there. The doctor is blown away. He doesn't know what to think. And I'm listening to her share this. And I said, Lord, here I am feeling stupid. Because you wanted to let me, because I love this lady, you know. It was like he was blessing me by letting me be part of the miracle, you know. But oh no, I was too afraid to look stupid. God said, see, I was giving you an opportunity because I was putting on you because my will was to heal her. I didn't even know she was sick. It don't matter if you know or not. If God lays, if, if the Lord puts it on you, go lay hands on somebody. I don't care if it's the middle of preaching. You go do it. You go do it because He knows what He's doing. I want to tell you today, do you know what I know? I know that God always hears me. I know God answers prayer when I pray according to His will. And I tell the truth today. And I know that all things work together for good. That God doesn't allow anything to come into my life that ultimately is not going to be for my good. Amen? Right. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Do you know what I know?